It's the Royal Oak Show with Carlo Cianotti. Tonight's guest, Emmy-winning producer Gary May, children's advocate Jeff Houston, Mr. Positive, and the Desperate House Guys. And now, Carlo Cianotti! Welcome back, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, coming to another fine episode of the Royal Oak Show. Uh, Andy, how are you tonight? Outstanding. Thank you, Carla. How are you doing? Great, great. We have a, an excellent, a stupendous show for uh, people out there in TV land tonight. We've got uh, some great guests. We've got the uh, Emmy Award winning producer, uh, Gary May, who will be up in just a moment. We've got uh, Jeff Hewson, who is a longtime friend of mine. We've got Mr. Positive. And as you've indicated, you're, wait till you see Mr. Positive. He's gonna, you're going to be leaving here tonight feeling that all is well. And then we've got the, uh, who I'm waiting for the most, the Desperate House guys. I can't wait for that. Um, Andy, there's been a, a lot of things happened to the Royal Oak Show since we've started uh, several years ago. Um, most of all, uh, we, we've received some uh, press. A free, the free press picked us up, and we're now world, uh, worldwide now. Have you received any sort of uh, publicity, or have you received any sort of difficulty in your life? Well, I... Uh when it was discovered I was a part of the show, uh, I was asked to pay double in some of the local Royal Oak eateries, which I found to be unusual. Uh, but well, it's uh, funny you should mention that, though. Yeah, I don't know. How about yourself? I mean, you get well, comped there, at places. There has been uh, some stardom, and then with a little bit of uh, the stardom comes some some burden. Uh, we are we have gone from obscurity to relative obscurity. That's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> I uh, ran into a friend the other day. I uh, haven't seen him in quite a while, and he said, Carlo. He said, you know, I've known you were a prosecutor at one point, you're a defense attorney at one point, you work for the attorney general's office, you're a Royal Oak City commissioner, and now you have a talk show. Carolyn must be so sad that you can't keep a, a steady job. So <laughs> I've got that going for me. Um, we've got some, let me see, we've got some good news, and uh, I'll have Mr. Uh, Positive coming on. Uh, in Lansing, they balanced the budget. That was a good thing. At least that's what they're telling us, and they're going to stick to that story. <laughs> we came real close, you know. Uh, you know, if the budget wasn't balanced by June 1st, this Friday, I think we, uh, the government, as we know, would have shut down, which probably wouldn't be a bad thing, but yeah. uh, not only did we come close to losing the government, but uh, if we hadn't have a balanced budget, I think all the legislators would have missed that big shindig up in Mackinac Island this, this weekend, right, so we've got right, that. Right, right, right. Well, I see, I'm, I see, does this mic work? I don't know. Is yeah, I think you're, it's on. I can hear you. Maybe it's a good thing uh, we're so big now, I don't have to be funny anymore. But uh, Andy, listen, I'm really excited about the show tonight. Uh, while I mosey on back to the uh, desk, why don't you tell the ladies and gentlemen in uh, TV land uh, what's going in, on, in and around uh, Royal Oak. Would you do that for me? I will. Thank you very uh, much, Carlo. Well, now a man who finally gave up jogging because he kept spilling his beer, Carlo Giannotti. I like that. That was good. That was good. You know, Andy, that uh, the garage sale and the uh, clay and glass festival is always uh, a big event, but the pickle... Uh, Pickleball, yeah. Pickleball. It's, uh, Tennis and bad, it's a badminton, by the way, I believe my... Uh, That's with the birdie and everything That else. would be that, correct. Of course, we're getting yeah. rid of the birdie in place of the pickle now. Right. So, yeah. Now, if they did that on trampolines, I think that would add a little spice to that game. Standing but room only, I it think. It is for seniors, so maybe <laughs> right. ease into that portion of it. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, enough of the banter. Um, we, have <laughs> we have a great show for you tonight. Uh, and uh, to, to start it all off, we've got uh, uh, one of Royal Oak's own, uh, uh, an Emmy Award uh, winning producer, uh, Mr. Gary May. He's going to come out tonight and tell us about uh, what he's done and some of the great things that, uh, that he has done and uh, his involvement, uh, in fact, with the Honor Flight. Without further ado, Mr. Gary May. <laughs> Gary, Gary, thank you very much for coming. Thanks. Have a seat. Make yourself at home. So what would you think great of that little... Great to be here. What would you think of that little banter back and forth? It's like, good. It's good. <laughs> Highly professional, very entertaining. And, and you would know, in fact. Yeah. Uh, well, we hope so. I mean, I would try to, anyway. But uh, I think you guys are doing a great thing here. It's a great show. It's a great audience. I well, know I paid for most of them to be here, so. <laughs> <laughs> and it's money back guarantee. <laughs> I well, hope so. If exactly. they're not happy, they get their money exactly. back right away. Hey, Gary, you, um, I mentioned that you're, the, uh, you're an Emmy Award-winning producer, and you have your business right here in Royal Oak, and you're a longtime resident of Royal Oak as 36 well. 36 years. 30. What, uh, before I get into what Gary May produ uh, Productions is, um, what brought you to Royal Oak? I got thrown out of Livonia. <laughs> now, see, this is the first <laughs> no. guest we've had that's been actually honest about why I he's going to do that. <laughs> I, uh, from college, I got hired back here in the Detroit area. Had friends of mine who told me, my family was moving at the time, where do you want to live? And I said, you know, I'm looking for something in the middle. And they said, you got to go to Royal Oak. You're 25 minutes from everywhere. 
And I said, of course, it makes perfect sense. So I moved to Royal Oak in 1971, and I've lived within a mile of what is now Royal Oak High School, um, right behind the Shrine Church in uh, Northwood. So it's a great area, and I love it. Been here 36 years. Don't have any plans to leave anytime soon. Yeah, we're neighbors, in fact. Absolutely. We're right over there. And uh, you, uh, you are the CEO and uh, founder, if you will, of uh, Gary May Productions. I, I am the chief cook and bottle washer and all of the above. I don't know if I'm a CEO of anything. I'm a master of one, I hope, and that's about it. So. Well, that's what happens when you own your own uh, exactly. business. You, exactly. You kinda, you but take it's, the been a, it's been a great love affair for you know my entire career. So I tried a couple of times to go off and work with companies and partner with people. And, and like anything, you got to have a certain synergy or a certain you know chemistry that works. And a lot of times in our business, we're all made up of the creative side of the table. It's a little, it's, it can get issues going where you knock heads, and it's better to just stay on your own. Well, what kind of work do you do? Uh, I'm I've been producing and directing now for almost thirty years. Uh, I do a lot of creative consulting work with my clients. Um, it's it's one of those cases. Uh, I actually explained to my youngest son a long time ago when he used to hear me in the office at home say I would be late tonight because I had to go put a fire out. He would tell people <laughs> in school that I was a fire putter outer. <laughs> and, and then I had to explain to him one day, no, I don't work for the fire department. That's a you know, figure of speech. And so the idea is, is I get a lot of calls from agencies, businesses, clients uh, who look to solve problems that exist or to find a new way to promote brand market themselves. The typical was the same way it happened with the Royal Oak Schools back in the 90s. So. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. I know that you were involved uh, back then. There was a, uh, an issue, there was a time when we were trying to change their image and you, had a, you played a part in that. My involvement in the schools has been since my kids started in the schools, a PTA president at a couple different schools, worked with the board on many occasions, Gary Briggs among others. Gary, nice to have you with us tonight. <laughs> Love you, man. Hey, you want to switch seats? You want to just come oh, over here? Carl, I like your job. <laughs> and I, and I, it's always been a great thing. And I was asked by, uh, by uh, uh, some of the principals and the superintendent when they were beginning a, something called the Strategic Planning Committee back in the early 90s to be a part of that. Rose Tonetti, who at the time was at Dondero, wanted me to be on the marketing committee. And along with a few of us, we kind of banged heads for about three weeks over what was the right thing to do. And I have a kind of a phrase that anybody who knows me in my business, I say, if it ain't broke, break it. Because that means we've been sitting on the same thing for too long. So it was my idea to come in and change the way we branded the Royal Oak School District. And I changed the name to the Royal Oak Neighborhood Schools, created the new logo, and that's what you have today. So well, we, we knew early on in the early 90s there were changes in the wind. I mean, we've, we're all aware of that. It's just the, the nature of, of the city. But So uh, you were kind of in on the ground floor and, and pretty what much right started the back then with the people that you were working with, mm -hmm. we have uh, the, the, the system that we have now, which is great. And of course, you're referring to Gary Briggs, who is the president of the school board, who's just second handsome time man, back to Very it. handsome man. He really likes the Royal Oak Show. I don't know if he likes the Royal Oak Show so much as he likes me. I don't well, know. when is he going to be on? I got to watch. He's the first uh, first uh, guest okay. in the fall, Good. I believe. So. Good. <laughs> um, I introduced you as an Emmy Award winning uh, mm -hmm. producer. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that because uh, while we were talking today, there were a great many things I learned about you that I didn't know before. I've been uh, very fortunate. I have uh, accumulated a few Emmys over the past 20 some years. I've been very lucky about that and I'm very appreciative and grateful to my clients. Um, what were some of the things that, uh, that you did the, to well, get those awards? Interestingly enough, um, uh, the one that you will all know is I currently direct and produce a series for the Henry Ford Health System on Channel 7, uh, seen every month called Minds of Medicine with Paul W. Smith, right. who's okay. from WJR Radio. And we won an Emmy for that show a few years back. And, Currently, I'm fortunately again, knock on wood, nominated. Maybe we'll win again. But my very first one was a great, a great opportunity back in 1984. I was asked by the local ad agency Young and Rubicam to help them with a campaign that, at the time, Mayor Coleman Young was adamant about changing the way uh, kids reacted and acted on Devil's Night. And we came up with a new campaign, a public service announcement to help prevent those issues on Devil's Night, which uh, we created the show, the commercial, and uh, Lem Barney was the voiceover. And the whole story was basically that young people would be the ones who get burned if, if they got caught setting fires. And uh, it was an award-winning, Emmy award-winning, and it's been aired nationally for, probably aired for about 15 years. And you're also the representative for the, um, the, the, the Emmy Awards uh, here in Michigan, correct? correct. I'm, I'm the current president of the chapter, the NATIS chapter, which is the National Association of Television Arts and Sciences, uh, better known as the Emmy people, and I'm the president of the Michigan chapter. 
I know you really can't uh, tell me, but uh, I'm sure that the Royal Oak Show is probably up there. And wait. Okay. Up, uh, all right. All right. I don't want to ruin the surprise, but uh, I'll just I'll wait for the envelope to be that. Greg Walters not won enough Emmys. That's what I think. Greg and I have already got our tuxedo uh, fitted. June we only 16th, have one tuxedo though. June so. 16th at the Gem Theater. Come on down. Okay. And uh, what uh, what's that going to entail? What's that? Uh, it's a black tie event. It's an it's a strolling dinner. We have a great number of presenters from around the state. I of course will kick off the show as the president. I've got. Miss Michigan, Miss Michigan USA, who's actually from Troy, a local girl. And she ever asked about me? Communications all the time. Okay. Communications major at MSU, so we're thrilled to have her in. Uh, and then a week later, she's at uh, Donald Trump's big show for the Miss USA pageant. So we get her the week before the show. So. Well, it never it never ceases to amaze me, and, and you're you're down home Royal Oak boy. Yeah. And that's and there's, these are the things that this show is all about. Um, Gary, in just a little while after the break, uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that you. have you've done and uh, one of those things is the uh, your involvement with the honor flight uh, and I, I can't wait to get to that section Happy ladies day. and gentlemen don't go anywhere we'll be right back with Gary May the Emmy Award winning Gary May. okay welcome back uh, we are here of course with uh, Gary May who has uh, just told us that he's uh, come to Michigan and we can't get rid of him or come to Royal Oak and we can't get rid of him and uh, that's a good thing for us Gary, what keeps you here? Before we get into the honor flight, what keeps you here in Royal Oak? You're, you're world known, you, you can go anywhere you want uh, and, and make a living. What keeps you right here in Royal Oak? It's an excellent question, and I, I appreciate uh, being given the opportunity to answer it. I, there's something about the community that's always kept me here. Um, when my kids started in school, the way we've been involved in the community, I'm a mile from downtown. Uh, Karen and I, just we, we basically live in downtown Detroit if we're not in the backyard. So it's always been a great connection. Um, and the fact that we're 25 minutes from anything and everything. For my business, it's great. I mean, I, everybody comes to me. It, so it's, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to enjoy everything and bring, bring a lot of work to the community. I, quick story on the old commercial things. A lot of you people probably remember Sexy Specs with uh, Richard Golden. And um, I, I have to He's apologize a, dancing, on television. Uh, well, I have to apologize because it's my fault that he was dancing on the no. commercial. I, now I we know. That. <laughs> and uh, I apologize right here on the record. But we had a great time uh, shooting one of the commercials with him down on 3rd Street at Maine. One night we shut down the street. The Royal Oak Police were there. We had to stock him up on donuts, but it worked pretty well. <laughs> Uh, it was just a great, what was, what was Gary so Gary May said fun, that, not me, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> what, what was so great, though, is you start this thing at 10 o'clock at night, and word travels fast. And the next thing you know, we've got people in lawn chairs sitting on the end of the street corner watching us do a commercial. Like, you guys, this is going to take hours. And they're 2 o'clock in the morning. There's still people sitting in their chair waiting for us to yell action. But it was a, it was a great thrill to be able to do a commercial in downtown. So. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that um, it, this is a really vibrant community, of course. I don't have to tell you or any of the people that are sitting in the, the audience, but um, when, uh, when you and I talked earlier today and um, you talked about all the things that you've done, I, I really, the thing that um, got me the most is how you talked about the honor flight. Mm -hmm. and, and for those of us uh, who may not, if it's possible, the people that don't know what the honor flight is, it's uh, your, uh, actually Dave Cameron mm -hmm. and the organization came to you and they've asked you to right. help out uh, to get the word out that, um, well, I'll let you explain. It started with Dave Cameron the American Legion Post, 253. Right. And I think the thing that um, I need to get out quickly about this is Honor Flight Michigan is, a, is an interesting fundraising opportunity. It's a nonprofit organization. And anybody that knows anything about fundraising knows you get tired after a while of everybody asking you for money. This is the only organization I've ever been involved with that has a finite timeline. And what I mean by that is, in about five more years, we won't have any World War II vets to take to Washington. Um, and that's just the, the nature of, of life. The cycle is very simple. Uh, the uh, World War II memorial wasn't completed until just two and a half years ago in Washington, D.C. The World War II veterans are, are dying across America at a rate of almost 1,100 a day. And there are about 6,000 veterans from Michigan who still live here. And it's our job now to raise the funds necessary to get as many of them as possible on a plane to Washington to see the memorial. And that's, that's, it's been a lot of work. And uh, Dave and uh, the whole group, there's a great committee involved, deserves all the kudos because uh, what they've been able to achieve in about five months that usually would take anybody a year and a half to set up has been amazing. So. Well, you're at the crossroads now where you've had an outpouring of support, obviously. But well, the community's you're, been terrific. But the, you're at a point now where 
you know, you've got to raise the money, and it's got to be, I don't want to say fast, but you're going from the grassroots, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, the Boy Scouts and everything sure. else in the, in the households, and you want to branch out and get out a little further, and hopefully, you know, being on the show here will help out uh, to, to right. reach out to the different organizations and corporations. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, and you're absolutely right, Carlos. With all due respect, we love the community, but there's only so many times we can ask the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts to knock on someone's door and ask for another dollar. And while we appreciate that and we'll never turn it down, it's important that some of the businesses and some of the corporations involved in Southeast Michigan, and for that matter, all over the state, take a second and reflect and say, is it worth it to make a sizable donation to this group so that we can get more World War II veterans to Washington, D.C. before they pass away? That's really our effort right now. Well, and you're doing more than just raising money. You, Gary May, mm -hmm. you've actually been on two of these trips now, the, yep. the flights. Yeah, I've uh, done two trips now. Karen and I did the last trip in May, and it was a tremendous experience. We, um, to see the faces and, uh, and hear their stories, uh, I actually were fascinated when you put a bunch of 85-year-old men together and, and women as well on, uh, on an airplane and a bus. Uh, it, it's really fun to listen to them uh, tell stories across aisles and realize that I never realized that that guy was in a company next to me or he was in a bunker at some site in World War II down the road from me. And, they, and it's amazing to hear their stories and as they relive it. And uh, we look forward to doing many more. There's two more flights scheduled right now, and then the third and fourth flights are in August and September. I'm sorry, the fifth and sixth flights are in August and September. So we've got a lot of plans for more. And then hopefully, you know, if the funding comes through, we'll keep doing this for as many years as it takes to get as many there as we can. And that's the idea. You're just going to keep going until we Absolutely. everybody has a chance. And it's it's right. their memorial, too. It's, it's their the memorial. That's why we're taking them. How, how emotional is that? And I, I, there are a couple other things I want to talk to you about. But you, when you meet these guys, like you can say of any veteran, basically, uh -huh. it's hard uh, to, to make that sacrifice. But when you talk about a World War II vet who are the oldest vets we have, mm -hmm. To think that they were at one point 16, 17, 18 years old and facing horrendous situations now to see them, how emotional is that for somebody who's well, actually... It's very there? emotional and I know you're trying to get on my uh, my soft side now and I know Greg's sitting back there getting ready to chuckle because he's probably got a close-up of me in case I tear up. But uh, with all due respect and in all seriousness, one of the best stories, Karen and I were part of the last flight. We had a gentleman who sat on, on the bus with us riding out and he says, you know, I've, I haven't been on an airplane. And... What do you mean, never in an airplane? He goes, well, since I got shot down in World War II. And I was like, you're kidding. You're going to go get on a plane with us? He goes, yeah, so stay close. But, and when you realize, he tells the story. He got shot down in World War II. He's never been on a plane since. So this was a great experience for him. We had another gentleman who'd never been on a plane but served in the Navy. And Northwest Airlines, who's a great partner with us, gave him a, a set of wings at the end of the flight because it was his first flight. He's 91 years old, never been on an airplane. So, so those are the types of things that keep you coming back. And, yeah, and great stories, and, and they're never at a loss for words, trust me. I mean, they may start out a little quiet, but they're never at a loss for words. And I'll tell you another thing is they have a tremendous amount of energy the day we take them to Washington. They can, they can start at 4 o'clock in the morning and get on that bus, and at 10 o'clock at night they're still talking the stories, and it's just wonderful. So yeah. it's a great thrill for them and their families. Well, I appreciate all that you and the organization, Dave uh, Cameron, uh, mm -hmm. are doing. Um, what, what can we do? What well, can we do is honorflightmichigan.com. It's all one word, and if you can tell as many people as you know, and the neighbors, knock on doors, whatever, just go to honorflightmichigan.com and, and just check out what we've done in what amounts to be about six months, and it's rather amazing. And we have, uh, we've completed a little video that I put together documenting the first trip and some of the, some of the work that the committee's done. We have some copies of some interviews that Dave has done, the newspaper articles that Kathy at the Tribune has written. It's been terrific. And, uh, and the other thing is to keep in mind is that everything we do at Honor Flight is free for the veterans. Um, they, all they have to do is register. And it's first come, first serve. And when the flight comes up, we take them to Washington. All expenses paid. Well, Gary, it's been an honor having you on the show, and I will look forward to the uh, invitation for the uh, Emmys for the Royal Oak Show. And keep <laughs> up the good work, truly. Thank Thanks you very much for, for having coming on. Thank Appreciate you. it. The WROK staff and volunteers wish to thank our studio audience and our viewers at home for making our first season of the Royal Oak Show a huge success. Tune in to WROK TV next October when we start a brand new and improved season of the Royal Oak Show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Royal Oak Show. Only if you could see what happens during these commercial breaks. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, our next guest on the show tonight is a good friend of mine, uh, someone who you'll be amazed at uh, all of the things that he does when he's not being the quiet and unassuming uh, person that he is. Without any further introduction, I would have you introduce my friend, Jeff Hewson. Jeff, come on out here and tell us what you got going on. <laughs> have a seat. Thank you. Okay, some, one of these days we're going to talk about all the things that happen during commercial break. Okay. <laughs> what stays in commercial, or what happens in commercial stays in commercial. That's what I, I hope so, unless our microphones were working. So. Either that or ends up on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I got a feeling that that might happen. Uh, Jeff Hewson, you, we've been friends for quite a while. Um, you are, of course, a, a Royal Oak uh, resident. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to ask the question, what brought you to Royal Oak? Uh, in, uh, in my youth, I, I grew up in the city of Detroit, but as a kid, I was very active in Boy Scouts, and uh, many of my friends were uh, uh, members of the troop out here in Royal Oak. So I got to know Royal Oak very well. Uh, and uh, when I got married to my wife, for 15 years ago, we moved in because it was sort of in the center of the city. Of my, her parents were in Bloomfield, my parents were in St. Clair Shores. So it was right in the, you know, Royal Oak's a great city. It's right in the middle of it all. And uh, so we've been here ever since. And that's a, that's a good thing you chose our city to live in. What, what keeps you here? You, I, you have a family. Tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, I have uh, a wife, of course, and uh, four children. Uh, and I like to tell people that I have uh, four children by three different women. <laughs> and we're going to get to that in just a second. <laughs> uh, that came up. I was, uh, our, my children currently are ten, uh, 11, 11, 10, and 10. We, and we have two adopted. So uh, five or six years ago, I was in downtown Royal Oak and getting out of the car. And the troop was piling out of the car. And woman was walking her dog and she stopped me and said, are those all your children? And I came up with it. I said, yeah, I've but three different women. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've used it ever since and I've told all my friends in the adoption community and they use it. So That's I originated though. I do have the patent on it. So I was going to use it tonight, but you, uh, I know you stopped me. There was a whole host of lawyers that wanted me to sign something. And I said, all right, Jeff, <laughs> it's your joke. But um, you came here to Royal Oak and we're happy that you're here. Um, I know I'm happy to have you as a friend. What keeps you here in Royal Oak? I know, I, you know, if I went through the list of things that you're involved in, we'd be here for 12 hours. But uh, so I'm not going to do that right now. But tell me some of the stuff that keeps you here in Royal Oak, keeps you coming back. Well, great friends, uh, the people I've met, yourself and many others that are very committed to uh, the community. And uh, my wife and I have been very active in uh, communities throughout. Uh, in fact, I met my wife. We were working with inner city with kids in uh, Highland Park, at-risk kids in Highland Park, and that's where I met my wife. And uh, but we really decided to settle in Royal Oak because it was a great family community. You could walk to a downtown, have fun more than a uh, mile and a half mile of downtown, so we can walk to downtown. But we have a lot of great friends. We love the schools. In fact, I was a former PTA president at uh, Whittier Elementary. My wife is a constant volunteer in the, the schools, myself included. Uh, so we absolutely love the community, we love the downtown area, we love the neighborhoods, and we love the schools. Uh, and uh, it's a great commute. I, I work and visit with people throughout the state and uh, get travel quite a bit, and uh, it's very easy to get to every place. And of course, when 696 came through, everybody else found that out, but we were fortunate we were just above the curve. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, to say that you're involved with the schools, I think is, at least in my opinion, a kind of an understatement. Uh, I always think it's a good... Uh, 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 judge of character to determine how involved someone is in the community in the schools. Tell us what you do and, and, and why you're involved with the Royal Oak Schools. And remember that Mr. Briggs is still out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, why? My mother was a, t uh, Detroit pub or was a public school teacher in Frazier. Uh, and when she, when she had our, my older brother, she quit wor working and uh, stayed at home. Uh, but she was always involved, very active in the PTA, and uh, so we've been involved in the P my my family's been involved in the fam PTA for generations. My grandmother was a uh, university professor in Guelph, a little small town in Ontario, in Ontario. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, was a field hockey coach. So tough, tough lady. Taught home, home economics <laughs> and uh, was was uh, quite an inspiration to me. But she she as well as my my grandfather were always involved in community, and. Uh, my, f my grandfather was from a little, t uh, lived in a town called Monroe, 
Michigan, just south of I, here. I've heard of it. Yes. And uh, he was a Qantas member and very active in the community. And as a kid growing up in the city, one of my favorite things was in the summer, we'd go live with my grandfather for a week. So here as a city kid would get this small town experience. And I loved the fact that my grandfather would walk through town and wave at everybody and he would know everybody. And he wasn't a great driver, so sometimes the waves weren't very friendly, but. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't all the fingers involved either. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he had a great, a great attitude. He didn't even know what that meant when they gave him one finger. So <laughs> <laughs> he waved back. Yeah, anyway. he waved back with anyway. the same finger. And sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jeff, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that you're. Um, first of all, I'm happy that we're friends. We met uh, a couple of years back, uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know half the things about you until we started talking. Uh, uh, I know that you are uh, involved with the. Uh, uh, you're an advocate for adoptive parents, which mm -hmm. I think is a great thing. Um, as you know, what I do during the day is kind of similar things. I, I see abused and neglected kids and um, involved in the adoptions yes. as well. Um, tell us a little bit about, before we go on break, what you're doing um, in, the, in the world of adoption, so to speak. Well, my wife and I, as, as I told you, we adopted two children. We adopted our children by, uh, from, adop from China. But we're very involved in the adoption community. We've, several, we've coached several families that are in the process of adoption. But one of the issues that we've been asked to work on right uh, currently is uh, last year the state of Michigan graduated some, they, they call it aged out, 737 kids out of their foster care system. These are kids that never had a stable home other than a foster care. And foster care is great. But it's not to be all end all. And so we're trying to engage the, uh, we're starting a, a project in Oakland County to engage the church to respond to this issue the, of these 730 kids that graduate, age out of the system and don't have a support structure. So That's significant. When you say age out, that means that they're, they're on their own, basically. When they, they got to that age, they're, whatever services they were receiving, they, they're on their own. They're basically on their own. And I know for most of us, uh, I don't think my, most, I, I know at 18 years old, I wasn't prepared to be kicked out of the nest and put on my own. I no, I'm, I'm still not prepared that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, in just a second, we're going to come back from break and we're going to get into some of the more uh, uh, meatier things that you're involved in. And uh, can you stick around? Yeah, absolutely. Good. I hope you can too. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with Jeff Houston. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. With us we have, of course, uh, who he wasn't able to leave during the break, we have Jeff Houston. Jeff, welcome back to the second part of your Thank interview you. here. Jeff, just before we left, you mm -hmm. were talking about um, what you're doing involved with the uh, uh, Advocate for Adoption. We interrupted you briefly. Why don't you go a little bit in more detail about what it is that you're trying to do and well, what we want to engage the local church uh, because um, uh, we feel like they're the ones that could respond to this issue. And there's, uh, and for example, in Oakland County, there were 62 of these children that aged out of the system. So if you look at um, the children that are now ready for adoption that have sort of raised their hands and say, I I'd take a family. Uh, these are children that have identified themselves and the agency of freed and cleared them. To these are older children too, right? Some of them are, you know, they're all older, but we're trying to target the 11 and 12 year olds. So the 10 years from now, you and I are going to have this conversation that 62 children in Oakland County at 18 were just put out, uh, put out because they, they and never having a family. So uh, we're going to engage uh, the communities. We're going to engage the, um, the, uh, the elected, uh, the elected officials and those, and uh, we're going to, we're going to really want to bring it, bring this issue out in the front because I think the issue is really that people just aren't talking about it. Now there's a lot more talk about it with uh, some issues that have happened in foster care and some talk about foster care and certainly the budget issues. If we could take those 730 kids and put them in homes, it'd be far better on the state and on the budget than having them on our roles and it's a, it's a far much, much better place for them to be in a home as opposed to being raised by the state. It's, it's kind of unfortunate too because as the budget, we have budget problems, that's usually the first uh, area to be hit, uh, the kids, uh, mm -hmm. foster care. you know. Department of Human Services. Um, I think Frederick Douglass once said, uh, it's easier to build a strong uh, child than it is to repair a broken man. So mm. you can write that down somewhere. You can use that if you'd like. So. <laughs> anyway, what you do during the day um, is not too far from what you do when you're in your spare time either. You work, what do you do during the day? You're, you're, I know, but tell everybody else. During the day I work for uh, Cornerstone Schools. And what is that? Cornerstone Schools is a private school in the city, a faith-based school in the city of Detroit. We have uh, seven schools throughout the city of Detroit. Uh, and we educate kids pre-K pre -K through eighth grade. And this costs them how much? Uh, there's a, there is a tuition, but it's on a sliding scale. And the program that I run is a scholarship program for uh, children whose pa parents are in prison. Okay. Tell, uh, us, tell so me a little bit about that. We talked. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit familiar with that because right. of what we do, but um, how does that work? What are you trying to accomplish with that? 
Well, my wife and I, like I said, we met with working with at-risk kids, and there's no greater kids that are at greater at risk than kids that live in the in, the, in urban areas and have a parent outside the home. So there's, it's bad enough to have a single parent, but to have a single parent who's incarcerated or have a parent who's incarcerated, there's a stigma that's attached to that. And so we even had a, we even had challenges with people that didn't want to take the scholarship money because they didn't want to be identified with the fact that their mother, mother, or father was currently serving in prison. Uh, so they're, they have self-esteem issues, they deal with issues, uh, all of the at-risk behaviors go off the charts with these children. Uh, and so we decided that uh, Clark Durant, our founder, and I, when I approached him about it, uh, as well as a friend of, mutual friend of ours, both Mike Timmis, uh, we talked about how we could engage these children and give them one thing in their plus column, when meeting an excellent education. So we decided to do something that's never done before, and we offered them scholarships, full-ride scholarships to Cornerstone schools. They had to, sub they had to submit to some other things that we asked them to do, meaning they had a mentor. Uh, they had to participate fully in the other things that the Cornerstone asked them to do. It's an 11-month school year. Uh, and it's, it's a tough program, too. I mean, I, and it's a program for those of us that may not know. It's K through 8. Pre-K through 8. And um, there's uniforms involved, and there's a, there's a strict regimen, and it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's a screaming success, if, if you don't mind me saying that. And you have a lot to do with that, I'm sure. Well, I, I, don't, take the, I don't take the credit. Uh, there were a lot of uh, friends of mine that started the school some uh, uh, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, with 113 students, and now they're up to 1,300 students across the city of Detroit. And we're uh, redeeming some of the old schools that are sitting vacant in the city of Detroit and uh, putting kids in them and educating them well. In fact, we have a, we teach a Chinese language program. We're working with, you know, we're excited that uh, Royal Oak Schools is gonna include a Chinese language program next year, but uh, one of our Royal Oak uh, citizens teaches our, our uh, Chinese language program here in our, oh, in our schools, so. Well, I, you know, talking about children, it, it really is, it, it, when you work with children who are basically starting behind the eight ball anyway, they've got a great disadvantage. And you, through Cornerstone and through the program that we're going to talk about more in detail, you're trying to erase that stigma. And, and in so doing, you're helping the society as well. I mean, so it's not just pouring money down, uh, you know, down a, a, a hole. Um, tell me about this, uh, this program. I know that you're raising, uh, you're trying to raise money for uh, scholarships for the mm -hmm. children whose parents are in prison. And you've got a, a, a program coming up at the end of the summer. Right. Tell, <coughs> it's all yours. Tell us about that. Last year we had a, uh, a cornerstone day at the night at the park. Uh, we had it at Comerica Park, and last year we were lucky enough to draw the Chicago White Sox series. Uh, and so we, we had a game on a Tuesday night where we purchased 5,000 tickets. And we sold, some of them were group sale tickets that went to, the, went, went to the parents, but the other ones were sold at a premium between $50 and $250 to our, our friends in the community that bought these tickets. And before the game we had a, uh, a huge picnic outside at the, the church next door, which has a, uh, St. John's Church, which has a, quite a large picnic area right next door to Comerica Park. And we had this huge event of 5,000 people. Well, this year on August 21st, we're gonna have 17,000. Last year was the most successful. 17,000 17, tickets. 17,000. Wow. And uh, so the Tigers have given us uh, unfettered access to many things that we, they hadn't done, that we hadn't had in the past. There's no other group has had in the past because they believe in the cause of what we're doing so much and the way we, the, the success of the, the money that you raise here goes uh, directly has a has an impact on the scholarship for these these young. A portion boys of that it goes to our scholarship fund. As you as you know, the economy in Michigan is a challenge, and in the urban city in the in Detroit, it's even more challenged. And uh, so as parents lose their jobs, it's sometimes they can't make uh, some of their their tuition payments or what we ask them to make and so this makes up sort of makes up our shortfall for the end of the year and for the going into the next year. What a great thing and it, it's it giving these kids a leg up. I just have about 30 seconds uh, and I want you to make sure you mention that uh, that website so that people can get involved. Sure it's uh, be a tiger for kids plural dot com. One word. One word. All right, and on that website, they'll be able to get all the information? They'll be able to order tickets. They'll be able to get the link uh, to, uh, the org to the Cornerstone web, to the Cornerstone, as well as to order our tickets for however many like. We'd love to see as many people from the community come out. Good. Love to see Royal Oak rep well represented as it usually is. Right, we'll see what we can do. Jeff, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Hewson. Our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be Mr. Positive. Don't go away. You're going to enjoy this, this section. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Royal Oak Show. This next guest, I'm really looking forward to it. You know him as Mr. Positive. He can be heard on WRAF every Friday between 12 and 12.30. Tonight, we have him here on the Royal Oak Show. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Baltif, Mr. Positive. 
An honor. An honor. A pleasure. Pleasure. Right. Pleasure. Have a seat, Mr. Positive. Greg, I'm looking forward to this uh, because, as you know, we talked earlier today. Um, I'm not prone to negativity myself, and this show is all about being positive. Um, tell, me, uh, tell me a little bit about Greg Baltif and how you got to be Mr. Positive. How'd that name come to be? Well, about 25 years ago, I was listening to a radio station, 96.3, and at the time, it was Power 96 FM. And because of what I experienced through life, I had realized that the person who was on the air was hitting hundreds of thousands of people. Kind of like the Royal Oak Show. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And I wanted so desperately to be a part of it. So I called him up at 1 o'clock in the morning. His name was Sonny Joe Harris. And I said, you're hitting 800,000 to a million people at your time, in your time slot. And I said, can I say something? And the very first thing I ever said was, like a starving wolf, you'd rather die than admit defeat. Rage, rage against the dying of your dreams. Remember, in order to do the impossible, you must see the invisible. And lastly, it's Friday night. Let the games begin. And from there, it just took off. He asked the um, program director, and um, I was on five, six nights a week from like 10.50 to 11, 11.10. And it would take a couple calls, and it just that's how it all started. Well, I, you know, I, I've listened to you a few times on WRIF, uh, and uh, between 12 and 12:30, uh, yeah. they got your plug in again. So, yeah. um, you. and you know, it's amazing the energy level that you have. Um, you know, you're not used to being uh, the, under the hot lights tonight. You're usually on a telephone being yeah. interviewed. But uh, after you're done with that segment, at least I was, I felt better for having listened to it. And uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the show. Um, I'm going to tell the ladies and gentlemen out there a little bit of uh, a little bit about you, or maybe you can. You're, what do you do by um, what's your by, by, uh, by what do you do for a living? I basically am a personal trainer, and I work in Royal Oak and uh, Fitness USA and a couple other places. But uh, essentially, I'm a personal trainer, and I basically want people to experience the benefits of working out, getting in shape, feeling better, because I feel you become a better human being if you feel better about yourself. Self-esteem, you must remember, comes from the accomplishment of your goals and accomplishing what you want to set out to do. It's not something that I believe should be just given. Self-esteem, that you're good, but you've not earned it, in a sense, and that's, uh, it just ties in with Mr. Positive and what I would like to convey to the uh, listening audience. Well, we, when we were talking today, uh, earlier today, when we were getting ready for the show, uh, you know, I, I was amazed at some of the things that you said. And basically, the, 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 the bio that we have for you on the website is that you, you teach, you're a motivational speaker and you teach positive attitude through poetry. And I think you just gave us a little uh, a taste of that just a little while ago. What are some of the things that you're most proud of in, in being Mr. Positive for so many years? Oh, God, Carlo. Um, people come up to me, they like what I do. People come up to me and they say, hey, I like what you said. And it gives me such a good feeling. Whether I change the world, which I so desperately want to do. One person at a time. One right? person yeah. at a time. And I just, it just, I go to home, I go home at night and, and I am a macho person, but I do, in a sense, I cry very easy because I feel so deeply about what I want to accomplish, and what do I feel about humanity. If you, if you see a great movie or you hear a great song, what does it do to you? To me, it is so visceral, so deep, that I gotta tell you, Carlo, it's just I wanna have the answers for what moves people, what shakes them up, what makes them move, get up. And like I was talking to you earlier today, I found out a very, very um, sad number. 90% of all people that go to work do not essentially like what they do. 90%. That's an incredible statistic there. I mean, that, that means that 90% of the people roll out of bed every morning and say, I hate what I do. And I, I can tell that you, you really enjoy what you do. Oh, yeah. Both I being mean, Mr. Positive as well as a physical or a, a personal fitness instructor. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just... 
it's a great reward because people come up to you and go, man, I'm sore, I feel good, I, I'm looking better, and all these positive things. And it's just an unbelievable feeling, Carlo. And it's just that I want to never let it stop because for my essence, my being, it's about creating change, positive change, because it snowballs. If I do something good for you and the audience, then they turn around and they do it. And it never stops. And to express how desperately I need to make a difference in a positive way, I couldn't articulate it with words. Well, Greg, let me, let me ask you this question, and we're, we're really proud to have you on the show today because it is Thank all you. about being positive. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't think, other than uh, watching the reruns, that's the only time Andy cries <laughs> when he watches the reruns of these shows. <laughs> but other than, <laughs> other than um, I mean, talking about positive things, we try to stay away from the negative because I, I, personally I agree that one person at a time you can change the world. Um, how do you go about that? I mean, other than your radio program on WRIF, on Friday between 12 and 12.30. When you walk up to somebody, I imagine people sometimes think, wow, who is this guy and what's he talking to me like this? But after a little while, do they change? Do they warm up to you? Oh, yeah. Um, I got to tell you, Carlo, I've been misconstrued all my life as being eccentric, wild, weird, different. And what I do is I'll overhear a conversation or somebody will say something or they're working out and I will go up to them and I will give them my two cents worth. And they will realize that what I have to say is relevant and it has some merit and they'll incorporate it into, into their lives. And I feel that that's the satisfaction that I get. It's everywhere I go, a lot of people I'll go into, you know, I don't want to be a braggadocio or a brag, uh, uh, but uh, it's a nice feeling that wherever I go, someone knows who I am. And then I always ask myself, I'll say, uh, you know, do I know you or how do I know you? Well, I've heard you on this. I've seen you do appearances at nightclubs or whatever, and they like what I stand for. Uh, I got to tell you, Carla, I get people that come up to me. They smoke. They get a divorce. They feel bad about themselves. And then for an hour, you know, I'm sitting there, you know, and they're just holding on to every word that I'm saying, and hopefully I'm helping them. And the hard part is when someone's saying, by and you're talking to somebody, you don't want to stop them in the flow. So it's, it's a little bit difficult. It happens to me at uh, various nightclubs where I'm talking and really engaging in conversation with Great. somebody. But Let me ask you this question, and uh, a lot of people think that this is a shtick. Um, I, you know, I've just met you not too long ago, and I don't think it's a shtick. I think you actually believe in, in what you're trying to do. How do you stay? I mean, a lot of people are out there saying, man, you know, sometimes I have a bad day, sometimes things, I don't feel like being positive. Is there ever a time that you're not positive? Is there ever a time you wake up in the morning and say, God, I hate what I do? Well, I think... And be honest. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, my hero, uh, Elvis, once said, the image is one thing, the man is another. Uh, what I'm trying to do is become both. But like he said, and like a lot of very profound people, maybe King, Gandhi, Ayn Rand, Aristotle, have said that, it's, it's very hard to live up to an image. But I gotta tell you, Carlo, it's extremely fun trying to become that person. Because to me, there's two or three things that motivate you. To be loved, to love somebody, and to look forward to something. If you've got those three things, the world is your oyster. And it gives you a nice feeling. Myself, I'm not married, never have been. Um, no wonder you can be so positive. Well, <laughs> just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. We, we have just a minute here, and I want to make sure that I, we leave on a good note here. Um, Greg, um, what, what can people do to remain positive? People that don't have the fortune of meeting you every day, what can we do to remain positive and keep upbeat? I guess it's about attitude. And you and I were talking earlier today. Perception, if you could articulate it, how you said it. How you perceive life is how you live it. Yes, how you See, perceive life did. is how you live it. It's all about attitude. It's all about attitude. I can flick on and be negative for a second, and then all of a sudden think about good thoughts, and wow, I'm feeling great and ready to conquer the world. Greg, I want to 
thank you very much for coming on the show, and I was happy pleasure. that I was able to give you a little bit of positive. Yes. Even I was able to make Mr. Positive happy. For, yes. So, great. Thank you very much for coming on. Very welcome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We've got the Desperate House Guys coming on right after this commercial break. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try not to smile too much during this next interview. We uh, have uh, four rather good-looking young men. Uh, seated to my right. Collectively, they are known as the Desperate House Guys. Ladies and gentlemen, the Desperate House Guys. <laughs> Very good. Not I, everyone's clapping uh, just from the get-go. I'm <laughs> noticing that. And uh, your floor director is not doing her job. Uh, there's at least three people not clapping. These she was on everybody before clapping. I got right. yelled at. She yelled in the corner. I got yelled at my feelings. I'm writing this down. These people are gone after this show. <laughs> right. <It's> history. <laughs> Cut their salary and benefits and they're out of here. Exactly. Guys, I'm really happy. I'm looking forward to this part of the show because uh, actually I don't have to be funny anymore. Not that, not that I was before, but now it's your turn. Before we get into the, what the Desperate House guys are, let's, uh, let's have some individual uh, introductions. We got Steve Lynn in the Hello. back row. We've got Mike Bobbitt, of course, bringing up the uh, rear on that side of the couch. Really? <laughs> we've got Russ Brown in the middle, and then we've got uh, Mike Malik, and we've got... Uh, what was it, uh, the, the Mike sandwich over here on the, on the couch? No, it's the Russ sandwich. You the said Russ rather sandwich. handsome, which one's the most handsome? Ah, see that, uh, see I get to be the host. I'll tell you later after oh, that. Oh, okay, but. I know it's me. Hey, we're in a running for an Emmy here, guys, so uh, <laughs> cut me some slack. Tell me about the Desperate House guys. <laughs> you know what it does. You do uh, <laughs> city commission meetings. You get out of the house for what, $2 a night? Because I know they don't pay you much, so you're a desperate house guy. But you the benefits are just incredible, though. Exactly. Really. Yeah, that's so. that's good theater. We I just want to go out and share the happiness we are about being married, right, guys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're all happy. We're told that every morning, aren't we, Russ? We're <laughs> sort of like Mr. Positives, but without all the positive. <laughs> yeah. We're sort of Mr. Sarcastics. I don't know. That's Mr. Uh, bitter. It's, yeah. it's sure. Mr. Lemonhead. That, that comes to Which mind. Which one is Lemon? Mr. Bitter? I'm Mr. Bitter. For right. sure. I've been married Absolutely. the longest. <laughs> she beat the will right out of me. You know, little. this is all I have left. My father never hugged me. I don't think that's good either. No. <laughs> all you have left is a Royal Oak show. Is and it? a clapper <laughs> person over there. She was making. <laughs> you guys are worse earlier. than I thought. Did you hear her yell at me when I was trying to get up over there? Sit down, Mister. <laughs> <laughs> She yells at everybody. She does, doesn't she? She does, she does. Now, obviously, the Desperate House Guys, that's a play on that other show that, what is it, the Desperate... Shh, we don't want to get sued. Okay, well, right. then forget about it. Yeah. We didn't even, even know there was it. another show. Other show? <laughs> forget I said about? it. It's crazy talk. We can, edit, we can edit this out <laughs> after the show. <laughs> yes, I did just call Carlo Cliff from Cheers. Did you get that? I said... Billy, Billy Joel, Joel first of all, now Cliff from Cheers. I like and that. And Greg, your producer director, he looks kind of like Norm, so together you guys could get free drinks. Go That's a little known fact, you 4th know. Fourth Street, yes. <laughs> Who came up with Desperate House Guys? Was it a collective thing or was it. Uh, uh, my wife, actually. I think it was one of those things. Uh, hang out with your buddies, get outside the house, let me watch HDTV. So. <laughs> And that's how Desperate House Guys was born? Kind of, yes. yeah. 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 We're all equally afflicted, so right. we kind of hung out together by default. <laughs> Comedians are kind of jerky people, but the four of us all came up together. We really like working with each other, and uh, we kind of put it together in a nice little package that... Uh, <laughs> how did you guys really meet? Good idea. How'd you meet? Right. I'm going to throw my notes away here, guys. Oh, we're all stand-up. Yeah, we're stand-up comedians, <coughs> and we just all came up through the same circuit at the same time. So and you, you play a lot of times at uh, Mark Ridley's, of course, that's mm -hmm. how you come to us, but I'm sure you play yeah. other places as well. Oh, right? all over. I mean, okay. we, all, yeah. we all tour all across the country. We had the big Father's Day weekend the Extravaganza that's this right. Father's Day. They're going to be at the Lexington Music Theater yep. in fabulous Port Huron, Michigan. I know the place. I know yeah. well. We're going to be in South Lyon on uh, Friday the 15th, is it, Professor? Yep. I think so, yeah. Yep. Yep. And then West Branch, which is a gateway to Flint. Uh, no, be up it's there. not at all. Yes, Flint. It's well, it's, a, it's a gateway to Houghton. I don't know. For the UP, it's, it's, it's a gateway to Flint. There's a bar and a church and desolation. I don't know. I just, that's pretty much how that I don't think this works. show airs anywhere near that. Because if you stop really? at Flint, uh, what do, you, do you work for Google? Is that what I mean? <laughs> I've used those directions. I'm, still the clap. I'm a little rattled with the whole clap thing. I'll admit right off the get-go. Were you guys a little uh, impressed with all the clapping and everything that? Uh, yes, I yeah. liked it. Yeah. It was good. I normally don't hear that much clapping when I'm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Trust me. So that was good. I got to get one of them signs when and the next metal time we go out. I, I tell you, those metal bleachers scream, "What's going on here?" <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, wow, wow. Fred Sanford's there. Burr, 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 burr. You found him in the garage. It's very nice. You guys are killing me. It's cable. What do you expect? Nice. It's very eclectic, which is really something that doesn't match. Okay. It doesn't match. <laughs> <laughs> great. I love that picture. Where'd you find that from? That's nice. <laughs> I'll make a little bedspread out of it when you're done. <laughs> the, <rock tour. laughs> the lady in the front row does look a little mad. She keeps saying, play us a song, piano man. Play us a song. And so far, you We get it. Fun. You think he looks like Billy Joel. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> You know, he says we something funny, Clavin? he's proud of it for like two or three days. We he just keeps buried. repeating it over and over again. We have to be clean. This is all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> we were told not you to swear. You don't want to lose this gig? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'd hate to not get a return listen invite. To the yeah, exactly. We were told not to swear. So help me God. I mean, that's what we got, right? So here I, we are. We got four words left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took a little bit off the, uh, see, I got to interview you somehow. So Fair I took enough, a little right. bit off the website here, and each one of you were kind enough to give us a little little bit of an introduction into kind of what your your thing is uh, Mike I liked yours not the best but I like yours you were <laughs> you were this is I, I assume that you wrote this or somebody wrote it for you I don't know I don't even know what you're gonna it's read it's funny he didn't write it <laughs> 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 every Thursday try the asparagus steps <laughs> <laughs> you, you, somebody wrote that you are a self-professed Star Wars geek with the charm and candor of a punk kid who's just too smart for his own good. Is that kind of a accurate description of what you are? Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, I wrote it. It's very <laughs> accurate. It's, uh, and Mike, Mike Malik. By the, the way, brown is your color. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> this is the only suit that I own, too. Oh, buy another one. How about that? <laughs> That's a little known fact. <laughs> Target's open on the weekends. <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's wrong with Target? Oh, uh, nothing matches. But go ahead. You're fine. Really. <laughs> Fashion really. tips from Barney. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. No, no to self. Except we're dark. Okay. Three of you guys can come back. The last one, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let's get to you, Mike. Mike, you say that <laughs> golf is not a true macho sport. Is that? Uh oh. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. Well, we're not. Because you know, golf might be a sissy sport. Any sport that has an outing and all guys show up, gay. <laughs> So that's what you mean by that. That's exactly as far as I can go right now without going right to jail. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and on he that, we'll just violent thing. <laughs> we'll just move on to Steve. To be positive. You, you get a lot of your uh, comedic uh, background from the fact that you've got uh, a wife, four <coughs> sons, and a live-in mother-in-law. Is that yes. uh, okay? I, I would imagine that's a good place to draw your, your lost a bet. information from. <laughs> yeah. The, which part there? <laughs> Any part. Any of part it? of it? Well, not the mother-in-law. <coughs> there's okay. there's really nothing funny about, about your mother. mother-in-law. <laughs> Oh uh, no, four boys. You know, Good. a lot of stuff with that. Uh, um, can't think of it at the moment. No, yeah. they. Um, <laughs> but you know, you get affected by that kind of thing. You know, when when uh, kids want to ask. My oldest boy had uh, uh, asked me for help with homework. He goes, "What do you get when you add x plus y?" And I said, "A boy." <laughs> and. Uh, How'd that, how'd that go on the test? That yeah, the good. algebra teacher wasn't happy with that answer. I'll tell you. <laughs> and, and Steve is a product of Royal Oak Schools. So yes. Oh, that's <laughs> that's <coughs> saying Mr. a lot. Mr. Briggs still out there? No. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, Russ, I'm gonna get to you. You're ex. I don't say ex marine because you I know, always get I always get yelled at. You know never the guys who always get mad about that are the guys who never served or the guys who are like in another branch. Okay. Like the Navy guys are like, you don't say X. It's like. So you're a former Marine and yep. you're, you're self-effacing is what that's a... I well, I mean, it's not self effacing I just try to be honest. I mean, there's so <laughs> many things in your life that if you can't laugh at, they'll beat you down. So True. that's kind of that's True. what I do. I, I talk almost exclusively about my real life. And well, guys, we got to wrap this up. I know sure. it's been fun. June Thanks 16th. Thanks for taking up all the time. June 16th <laughs> at the, uh, yeah, where was it again? Lexington like, Music Theater, June right. 16th. Yes. And if we want to uh, get more information about you, where do we go? Uh, there's a MySpace page, uh, myspace.com, Desperate House Guys. Okay, well, good. Guys, thanks very much for coming on the show, and I uh, hope you'll come back. Time, You're not invited back, but yeah, uh, the rest of you guys are. Thanks, thanks for being you. Right, guys, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. One. Ladies and gentlemen, what a way to end the show. We've got the Desperate House Guys. Yeah, thanks again, right. and don't <laughs> tune back into the Royal Oak Show at our next show. Thanks, guys.